Uh, I first I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, this is very neat for me to get to share kind of a little bit of my my background and kind of my origin story, if you will. Um, so my name is Rachel Lemke. I am the founder uh, at Animal Data Services LLC, and I am an independent veterinary laboratory consultant. So let's get started. Um, if let's start kind of by looking at the credentials at the end of my name, um, you will probably see. Uh, you might think something's missing um, in terms of a credentialed veterinary technician degree or a DVM, VMD degree. Um, my career path has kind of taken me in a different direction. So um, in terms of vet med, um, I, I was a tech, uh, not a credentialed tech, but a tech um, in the lab and then quickly promoted to lab manager. This was at a private horse hospital called Mid-Atlantic Equine Medical Center in central New Jersey. So it's a very large referral and emergency hospital. Um, I no longer do that. I was there for nearly four years. I am currently an independent contractor for Boehringer Ingelheim Animal Health, and I help uh, with their equine health side with stats and fund research. I have also, and that's something I still do. So I started that March 2020, and I and here we are in April 2023, and I still do that. Um, in the fall of 2020, I created my LLC. Uh, it is quite the super niche, if you will, um, of independent veterinary laboratory consulting. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of background as to a typical work week, uh, what that might look like for a lab manager. So obviously every, it's going to be exceptionally lab heavy. Um, and I really love that given my background. Um, this is me in the lab at Mid-Atlantic. Um, the, the lab there is a, uh, a full, a full room. And that's the only activity in that space. that's not mixed with pharmacy. Um, and it tends to be pretty busy. So, uh, there's morning blood work. Um, there could be blood work coming in from uh, the ambulatory department. Um, there's a lot of sorting out what happened uh, when you weren't in there in terms of what happened with testing and billing. Um, you work very closely with the uh, with the vets, um, both kind of the the hospital specialists or surgeons on site and also the ambulatory doctors to uh, prepare samples for reference lab testing. Um, sometimes that looks like biopsy, sometimes that's infectious disease testing. Um, it's a variety of things. I did not handle Coggins in my position and we did not run Coggins testing at that practice at that time. So um, Coggins was not in my wheelhouse there. And one of the things that I actually really enjoyed about this job was you had to be good enough where you could pause a workflow, whatever you were doing, and um, basically prepare for an emergency. So depending on the type of emergency, we had SOPs. And so we'd run a standard set of testing. So if you knew what the type of case was that was coming in, you could prepare um, and have the machines and everything ready to go so that there was absolutely no delay from when the samples were available to when they were being ran. Um, I, I did a lot of cross training for the technician team and I also trained interns, um, a few years of interns. That was really fun for me because I know the lab is not really sexy for uh, some slash a lot of people, but um, it was, it was uh, a privilege to, to help them. And then there were a lot of troubleshooting issues. So you're dealing with equipment, you're dealing with equipment in emergency situations. And so when things break, sometimes you have to come up with a, a creative um, plan B. And uh, there were also some billing issues that you'd get to work on as a lab manager. Um, I don't want to say much more than that, but sometimes it could be, um, you know, working on a specific case or or a bigger a 
bigger type of project. There's obviously QC maintenance uh, cleaning for the equipment. Um, I was fortunate where I was able to have extra projects, uh, including research and um, a kind of not a side project. It was very much related to the lab, but uh, basically a new a new addition to my work, um, a new project. We decided to centralize through me, and that's with Boringer Ingelheim's ID PPID project in the states. So um, the main types of testing that I would handle in house would be CBC, CHEMS, fibrinogens, SAA, PCB, total solids, cytologies, many cytologies, not all of them. Um, and I'd set up aerobic cultures. This picture of me uh, smiling with a, with a plate that I purposely split in half to do um, a susceptibility on, uh, it was actually two different isolates. So there's, uh, there's two isolates in that plate, one on each side. Um, and it was, that highlights uh, the need for a successful and careful inventory management. That was the last plate we had and um, we made it work. So I was happy because it worked. In any case, uh, key, key qualities that helped me excel um, in that position and would help someone else excel in a similar position. I have extreme attention to detail, um, maybe a bit too much. I was definitely devoted to that job and that role. Um, and I had to have a lot of mental flexibility, again, uh, to handle those emergencies. Curiosity is very important. If something stops working, you want to know why. If there are new, new tests or new equipment on the market, um, it's good to be curious about them because then you can improve your patient care, potentially, uh, and love of learning. So um, it was, a, it was a, a great position for me. And, and great kind of starting off point, if you will. Um, here are some, I wanted to include some pictures. Uh, this is not, uh, I would take pictures of samples, but this was not extremely commonplace. When you are in that type of position, it tends to be much more go, go, go. So you don't like sit there and have like a photo shoot with slides. So um, this was probably a BAL, but it could have been a trach wash. Actually, it's probably a trach wash. Um, this is a belly tap. So uh, peritoneal fluid, abdominal fluid. This is coffin joint fluid, so synovial fluid. And this is whole blood, uh, extremely lipemic. So uh, very fun. Um, these are some of the cytology images that I took uh, while I was there. And this is an example of what I mean busy. This is what I mean. Obviously, there's no people in here. And I, I um, kind of marked out uh, the names on the tubes. But this is a very neat presentation of like what your morning could start with in terms of a stack of blood tubes and, you know, go, go forth and do. Um, this is also a frequent down here, this is also a frequent um, way that you might find the lab uh, after a busy night of emergencies. So um, it's always, always a surprise. So uh, I grew in my role there. I revived the research program that was there and I, by what I mean is I, I led five projects. So some of those were new. One of those uh, was a restart. Um, they were on EPM, SAA, um, pathogens in the racehorse. Um, this was me presenting ACVIM on the uh, SAA project. Um, that was really, that was really nice. So I did this in addition to my, my full-time job there. Um, and then it grew some more. So I worked with the local BI rep. Um, BI has a program called ID PPID in the States. And so uh, we decided to create a centralized strategy where it would come through, um, where all the testing, basically all the enrollments and everything would be handled by the lab, mainly by me, but not always, but, um, 
and would be handled by the lab. And it was, I created accessory workflows for it. So um, not only did we maximize the enrollments for the hospital um, and that doing so would lead to a net income of about 26,000 a year for send sales, increased 34% year over year. And we were actually able to successfully identify a lot of horses with um, kind of EMS, PPID comorbidities. So these um, kind of screens here show some of the spreadsheets I've made that um, kind of are part of that workflow. So uh, I really like Excel and data, but so for me, I really liked the the connection of a lot of what I was doing, uh, but I wanted a bigger challenge. So I um, put out my resume. I was looking for more challenging opportunities um, that were local to me, and I was not able to find something that worked. So I decided to create my own consulting business, um, which is the biggest challenge I have had to date. So my, my motivation in helping these veterinary teams, um, like how, like, why was I helping them? No, I wasn't helping them. Like, I don't help them just to help them. Like, what's the bigger picture? What's the bigger point for me? So I have a, a shirt that I, I really love wearing and I'm, I didn't wear it today, um, but it says, uh, be the change you want to see in vet med. So for me, um, one of my big goals with my work especially from what I was seeing in an equine only practice was that we know that a lot of our team members are really underpaid. Um, and so my goal with my consulting is to help these practices either save or create enough fiscal resources, money, cash flow, uh, to help them actually retain and grow their teams. So that's where like that project I just described um, with the BI rep, with the ID PBID program, that would net 26,000 a year before even expanding it or optimizing it. So 26,000 won't pay for a whole tech, but it could pay for part of a tech. Uh, it could buy new equipment, et cetera. So um, the, the, that's the why I do what I do. How I do that is I help strategically plan practices lab services. So that saves them time and money. Um, money because my, uh, my analysis and my evaluations can help save them money and time because they're outsourcing it to me. And we know vet med, people in vet med are, uh, tend to be extremely overworked and don't have extra time. So I help. We have examples of lab projects. Um, personalized lab equipment recommendations is something I do. I've been called like a, a matchmaker in terms of uh, in terms of equipment. Uh, vendor contract negotiations. I'm actually uh, starting to wrap up a really big one right now. Um, like was working on it last night. Um, so that could mean not just negotiations of trying to get not just trying to get the cheapest price, but trying to get the best fitting solution, whatever solution that is, whatever lab vendor that is, or multiple partners for the best price. So I'm not trying to just find the, the cheapest option uh, for them. I'm trying to find the best option and get that at the best price. Compliance sensitive cost-based pricing for lab uh, testing is something that I, I also do. Um, there are not a lot of benchmarks. Uh, if you're a practice manager, there's not a lot of benchmarks for the lab in terms of what the profit should be um, or how to price things. And so um, my approach is based on trying to improve compliance, but also maintain uh, strong profitability. I also help with lab design for architect plans um, and spatial reorganization of current spaces. And then there's also a variety of kind of one-off projects I can, I can do as well.
and I am fortunate to expand. So I've brought on Dr. Matthew Gutman and Sam Geeling. Um, Dr. Matthew Gutman is a board certified veterinary radiologist, and so he can help with the imaging side, while I can provide expert independent guidance on the lab equipment side, he can do the same for the imaging side. And Sam and I have partnered up to help uh, preserve and grow cytology skills in the vet med field and also other projects, but we're starting with that one. So a typical work week for me as an independent veterinary laboratory consultant, and when I mean independent, I mean, I don't get kickbacks from lab vendors. Um, so I have a lot of client meetings, uh, uh, data analytics kind of comes and goes. Um, I primarily live in Excel in terms of data, uh, graphic design, um, because I'm creating visual interpretations of my analysis. Um, I do a lot of networking. Um, what I do, I've been told I'm a one of one that no one else does this in the US that focuses on the lab and efficiency and profitability. And so um, I, I spend uh, a lot of time networking and trying to grow awareness for my services. Um, I'm always troubleshooting and finding, finding creative solutions to problems. Um, and then there's a lot of um, the business side, obviously. So that goes into project management and business needs. So in addition to the key qualities that you saw before, uh, the love of data definitely has to be there for me to do this. And my my ambition, my desires for vet med, where I see vet med being capable of, of going, the support I see myself being able to provide, um, and also the ability to work under pressure with anxiety, because as a, as a business owner, um, that's creating a new space and a new service. Um, sometimes there's uh, a lot of anxiety that comes with that. So this graphic shows some, um, some ways that I, I serve veterinary teams. And if we're talking types of clients, uh, I have clients all over the U.S. I'm currently onboarding a client in a mixed animal group of mixed animal practices in Canada. Uh, last summer, I had my first international client in Dubai. I work with both startups, amateur practices, and anything from equine only to small animal only. Um, so I'd say most of what I do is pretty universal. Uh, I also work with a lot of independent practices. And I'm picky about corporate groups or those with PE backing that I work with. Um, it's a conversation for another day. But I also have currently two, three, three uh, veterinary diagnostic companies that I consult for um, on specific topics. So I'm fortunate to have those relationships as well. And whenever, I'll go back. And whenever I am working with a client about uh, and and the ID PPID program comes up, or the because I also work with that data on the back end. It's part of my my position um, helping BI. So whenever I'm talking about BI or ID PPID or the companies that I consult for um, with with a practice, I always disclose that. To me, transparency is extremely important. So. It's the way I work. Um, I was fortunate in January to be able to present in Switzerland some research I had done with BI. So um, BI is the manufacturer of Percent, which is Percolide. And so I had um, access to a, a big data set through the IDPPID program. And so we presented, I presented these two. Um, projects that we had worked on. So this is, this is me presenting to uh, endocrinology experts from around the globe. And it was, it was um, a real treat. It was nice. And I also have an AARV, so American Association of Rehabilitation Veterinarians. Uh, I have a, an AARV grant with my uh, friend and former colleague, Dr. Kyle Clark. 
to study Lyme disease and sport horses. This is a kind of passion project for uh, for both of us. And so we were really excited to get this funding and I get to work on the data soon. So I'm very excited for this. I, it's, it's important for me to stay connected to current research, even though I'm no longer in a, in a boots on the ground lab space. So I'm excited about this. In terms of education, um, if you notice, there's no specific veterinary degree. So I have my BS in animal science from Barry College and a minor in business um, that's down in Georgia, where I'm from. And I have my master's from Cornell, also in animal science. Um, right now, that's all that I'm planning to add, uh, but time will tell. And if we're talking about past research, this has been a really helpful um, the research I've done in the past has set me up to be as flexible and creative as I am today. So in undergrad, I, I have the draft of the paper on the bulletin board next to me, but I, we worked on population structure and genetic diversity of Angus cattle. So that's kind of a one silo, if you will. Uh, I was working with a professor on the barber pole worm or homunculus contortus in sheep. Um, and then also uh, spermatogonial stem cells and the testis um, in horses and, and uh, dogs. So that was a, a variety of uh, research that I was able to uh, fortunately be a part of. Um, in terms of techniques at that point that I knew that was like applicable to vet med, I mean, as part of my animal science classes, I wasn't pre vet. Um, my plan was actually not to be a vet. I, I knew that, um, well, I pass out during dissections. So I knew that being a, being a vet was not, was not for me. Um, and I didn't want to try to inadvertently take someone else's uh, dream, if that makes sense. Cause I know how competitive schools were and it kind of, if your heart's not in it, why, why go through that? So um, in any case, not a vet. So uh, when people, if people refer to me as doctor, I have to, I feel like I should politely correct them because that's an important title that I, I have not earned at this point in time. So um, I didn't learn any, any techniques apart from like identifying white blood cells and doing like a PCB and maybe a total solids, maybe. Um, in undergrad, it was, it was more limited to like textbook knowledge and anatomy and things like that, not lab techniques. Graduate research kind of flipped that completely in the other, like to the other side of the spectrum. So um, I worked on sequencing, uh, genetics, uh, studied chicken reproductive physiology. That was not what I had intended to study, but those were the tools that I was fortunate enough to learn. Um, worked with qPCR intimately, immunohistochemistry, Western blot, ELISA, et cetera. So like they, I basically primarily an undergrad non-veterinary techniques and graduate research, primarily like super advanced diagnostic techniques, if that makes sense. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, on the job training uh, when I joined Mid-Atlantic because there was that entire gap in the middle. So um, I, I know that I was, it was kind of an unusual situation because there's not title protection, um, at least at, at that time uh, in New Jersey. So I guess I would have been considered an on the job trained tech then, um, but I don't refer to myself as a tech. I, I don't think that's appropriate. So uh, 